we all have human values. Those values um, have to do with what we think is important in the world, what we truly believe. And so when I talk about coming from the heart, I mean using the values that you have to um, help you decide what to say. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. On today's show, we have Patricia Ryan Mazden, and we're talking about improvisation. And that is the ability to get yourself out of trouble very easily and quickly most of the time, especially in the world of sales. And this obviously comes across to just your personal life, and it's a skill set that is pretty broad and useful just day to day. It also helps you add a bit of charisma. And I think you can add value from that perspective as well in your sales conversations when they're not these weird, horrible, scripted, word for word, verbatim phone pitches. If you can improvise and have a bit more fun with your prospects and your customers, I think that is a real value add for them. And it makes a difference for most B2B salespeople out there that are these corporate, weird corporate drones. Patricia is the author of Improv Wisdom. I've got a copy here in front of me. Excellent book. Highly recommended from me personally. You can find out more about Patricia over at improvwisdom.com. All the show notes of this episode are available at salesman.red forward slash 173. And with that all said, let's jump into today's show. Hi, Patricia, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm glad to have you on. I'm a huge fan of your book, which we'll come on to towards the end of the show, perhaps. And um, I'm excited to have you on the show just in general. And to set the scene, I feel like there's, um, (laughs) I don't want to use the word plague. That's the first thing that came to mind, though. But there's definitely a (laughs) shift in sales that's happening at the moment. And uh, just to give you a bit of background on this as well, the audience will know this implicitly because I talk about it all the time. There's this shift from the salesperson who's the consultant, who's asking good questions, who is adding value to the customer, to this very scripted, prescripted sales process and formula. And it it makes the sales force easier to scale, but I think it's adding less value to our customers and we're not making the most time out of uh, the time that we spend with them by doing this. So I wanna start with, uh, all that in mind, I wanna start, Patricia, by asking you uh, your thoughts on this. Clearly a leaded, loading question, I know where this is gonna go, but which are more interesting conversation-wise when you're sat with someone? Is it the conversation where you have over-prepared, everything's perfect, you know the questions in the right order, you know exactly where you wanna lead the person that you're sat with, or is it the conversation where of course, you've done a bit of preparation. You know who you're sat in front of, but you allow it to ebb and flow uh, and you're, you're responding to the quest- the answers rather than pushing your own questions. Well, you, you've really answered that uh, already. <laughs> we all know that those scripted conversations are an end in themselves. And, and we know at the minute we're, we're on the phone or in the presence of someone that begins to speak in a scripted manner. It just sounds different. And it's so easy to turn that off no matter how valuable the content. I wish people in sales really realized um, what a death toll that is. And um, the, the opposite using one's natural speech patterns to say the same kind of content really isn't that difficult. I think most people are afraid of that, of the blank page. But if you know your product and if you know, if you know what the value is in what you have, natural human speech um, spoken from the, the mind and the heart is a thousand percent better and more persuasive than any brilliantly scripted thing. I know that for sure. And I turn them off in my mind when I start to hear them, um, sadly. Maybe you do too. Um, do you know what? I, mean, I guess I don't know how deep in the psychology of all this we could go into. and we, we don't need to dive into that really. But why do we get bored and turn off when we know that something that has been thrown at us has been scripted? It's a great question because it's the same thing. I for, for years I taught acting, and there's the difference between words moving from your mouth in sequence um, and human communication. That a script, uh, a scripted work 
has a different quality and it lacks the real human presence, always will. There, I've, I've almost never known a, even a brilliant actor who can take the script and so completely make it into um, a human interaction. Those are the rare ones. But for the most part, the script pulls us along and we can let the mind go when we've got a script. And you can't, you have to keep the mind and the heart as part of a transaction. Okay, interesting. For anyone then who is listening to this, and we can get really practical here uh, very quickly, which is awesome. If they've got a script that's sat in front of them, most of the time it's going to have been tried and tested and there's going to be some data within the company at least that those words, that language, even the, perhaps even the pacing, it works to some extent. How can they take that script and make it their own? Clearly a script provides uh, content. It, it, it gives you often facts and data and figures and information and, and, uh, and value, value sentences that describe um, how I'm going to profit from this or that uh, idea or product. To be able to ingest them is, is to, um, instead of memorizing the script, study the ideas that are being presented. And then try telling those ideas to um, an eight-year-old child. Try talking to someone, your grandmother, or someone who is not a customer, but try explaining the content that you've had just in your own words. You know, your, your own words, whatever they are, are always going to be authentic. And if you can use the way that you communicate to um, share something that, you, that matters to you, that you care about, that you want to sell, um, you're 90% of the way there. We all know the sound of, of human speech, and it's different from the sound of a script. <laughs> Try it out. Um, get someone to ask you questions. Get that eight-year-old child um, that you talk to about the product. Say, what, what, didn't, what didn't you understand? And um, what I've discovered is our generation, the, millenn the millennials, and I'm bumbling over that, are, are terrified of conversation and of natural human speech. In fact, how often these days do you have to schedule a telephone call? Uh, just a few years back, if you wanted to talk to someone, you just called and they answered and you improvised, whatever it was. But it's um, we've, we're losing the ability just to trust our own voices. And that's, I think that's what I'm here to tell you, that your own voice, the way that you communicate, is already good enough. Try it out. How... I want to play devil's advocate here for a second because there'll be a lot of people, and I found this when I first started doing the podcast. I still have to, you know, especially for this show in particular, but I have to still remind myself that I'm here to ask questions that I want to know answers to rather than, you know, a week ago when I prepped a bunch of questions for the show so that if I ever do get stuck, I can look down uh, and, and, and run through them and keep the flow of the show and all that good stuff. I have to constantly remind myself to be authentic, speak how I normally speak, and and it's it's a constant battle. Is this is it always a constant battle, or can you get to a place where you can just speak authentically, uh, speak your mind to a certain extent as well, and be present in the moment? Is it is it a constant battle, or is it something that you just achieve one day? Well, I think I think you can, uh, but it in a sense it takes practice. Practice in not going to that script. For example, you could start your show instead of always looking at those crib notes. I'm not against preparation, but leave that preparation behind when you're one-on-one -on -one with, your, uh, with your audience and with your speaker. If I was looking down at my notes right now, it would interrupt the way that my mind is um, influencing my speech. And I need my mind to be free to try to make sense out of things. But I have to say, when you're improvising, when you're not sticking to the script, one of the things that happens is that you sometimes make mistakes, or you say the wrong word, or you, uh, uh, it's not quite right. And to me, that is, I think that's wonderful. If you are okay with it to say, oh, no, I, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. 
I'm, uh, I was confused. The last thing I said, I meant to say so-and-so, or uh, we have to be able to allow ourselves to be natural because the, um, the, the upside of this authenticity is we sound like real humans and you're more likely to be believed. We know that uh, right now with all the politicians going on and on, most of them are on script and you can go right to sleep when you know um, that it doesn't matter what the content is. So my, my suggestion is give yourself a break and allow yourself to set the script aside and just come at it from the mind and the heart using what you already know. Try it. I mean, what can you lose? So I understand, and this might be me just being a, a stereotypical bloke. I understand from the mind being present in the moment, um, trying to take you in, um, uh, trying to um, you know direct the conversation and, and, and all this stuff uh, that is going on constantly and being in a moment. But what do you mean by, and this is where the bloke side of it comes in, what do you mean by use your heart? Can you explain that a bit further? I think what I mean is that we all... We all have human values. Those values um, have to do with what we think is important in the world, what we truly believe. And so when I talk about coming from the heart, I mean using the values that you have to um, help you decide what to say. Uh, It's kind of a complicated thing because it's, um, I, I don't know how I put those values in place. For example, I value uh, appreciation. So it's important to me to notice what others are doing for me. Right now, you have probably gotten up in the middle of the night or have stayed up all night to keep this interview going uh, to be able to forward uh, an important purpose of yours, to help salespeople do their job better. And um, I appreciate that the, the effort that you've put into also to come back to reschedule this interview and whatnot. All of those things I want to keep in mind and notice. So if you will, my values of wanting to appreciate life and say something about it are part of the conversation, not separate from it. Um, I'm all for, uh, we need moral guidance, I think, today. And so uh, live the values that you already have which might be about being kind to other people, listening better, caring for them. This is fantastic because and I've done this for many years when I worked in medical device sales. Uh, and I'll use just me as an example rather than like bashing on the audience. But I would go into a sales meeting. I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be present. I'm going to pay attention to what the surgeon who I'm selling endoscopes to, what the, what their needs are. I'm going to match our products up with their needs if it's acceptable, it's approachable. And then as soon as they say, hey, we hate the competition, we want you to come in, then it all goes into uh, overdrive of sell, 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 and you 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 lose that momentum that you had of, of talking about values and yourself and being present. And I feel like salespeople are missing out on a real opportunity, and I missed out on it as well for many years, of if you can be there as a person, because it's so lackluster and because so many interactions in the, especially the B2B world are, you come in, you present, you leave. If you can get on that deeper level, you're adding value to the person that you're spending time with because it just doesn't happen very often. Even perhaps they go home, the husband, wife, or whoever makes telly, they put on TV, they don't really speak. They, 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 there's, I think I feel like there's human engagement and these human-to-human interactions are becoming less and less. Uh, they're becoming more important because they're happening less often. So how can we focus ourselves and is it is it, it could be just as simple as to practice but how can we focus ourselves to uh, to to learn to do this over the longer term of a conversation rather than using it as a means to an end as a salesperson just to close a deal i don't know i think that we need to begin doing it in everyday life in every interaction um I think since I've, I've been out of the workforce, if you will, I'm retired from teaching, I feel more able to uh, just be myself in all interactions because I'm not, um, I'm not on the other end of some financial transaction. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. How do you allow yourself 
that authenticity. I think maybe it starts in tiny, in tiny ways, um, little tiny habits. The next time you're um, at a grocery counter and they're checking your groceries out, uh, really look in the eyes of the, of the person that's um, helping you there and, and thank them. Notice their name badge and say, Marilyn, I appreciate your standing here all day to uh, bag my groceries. Because the point you made earlier, we are longing to be in the same room with another human. I think that's the thing we're, we're losing. And that's why an improv class, for example, is a great place to get together. And under the pretext of doing improv games, we learn how to be human together. Uh, it's not just listening with attention in some kind of mindfulness way, but it's, it's dropping all of that in favor of um, letting your humanness be in the room with another person. How does this all tie in? Because I think it ties in really nicely with the idea of charisma. Charisma. Well, if you, I'm um, trying to think of a, de a definition of charisma is how your how you seem to other people, right? And and it's a positive word, meaning that the way that you seem to other people is bright and helpful and positive. We all want to be that way, don't we? We'd love to be uh, to be thought, my, isn't she? Um, a positive energy in the room. How do you do that? How do you let your light shine? Oh, it's, um, it's a great goal to have. I think it is training, training your mind and your attention to focus on the positive, to focus on the other person, on what, uh, um, how you can help them. That's what the improviser does. The rule is yes and. So I'm going to listen to what you say and build on it rather than letting my mind just go back into my own thoughts and talk about me. The first thing I say to a group of students in an improv class is, it's not about you, but it's about you noticing everybody else in the room. So let's learn everybody else's names. And when you start to shift your attention off of me, 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 and how am I, and what do, what are they thinking of me, onto the other person, when you make that shift, um, I think the world changes and, and it can allow you to get in touch with that positive part of yourself. I think charisma comes from being more interested in other people than in yourself. I think you've got it spot on. I think charisma is, when I think of a charismatic person, and especially in my previous sales roles, there's, there's one guy, I've talked about him on the show before, he um, he should have retired about 30 years ago and he knew all the surgeons who are now consultants when they were still trainees. So he had this deep rapport and long-term relationship with them and he would literally walk into a room. He wouldn't try and sell anything. He wouldn't, he would, people would flock over to him because he would be telling all these stories and the consultants who he knew as kids he would have their registrars and their junior doctors in the room with them as well. And he'd be embarrassing the consultants by telling the registrars all the stories about the consultants when they were kids, all the, the screw ups that they made and all these kind of things. And it just reminded me then of how you were describing uh, the process of having this authentic self to be able to essentially speak your mind and not be tied down by the fact that you're getting uh, a paycheck from a, a company. And that obviously then affects your decisions, especially in sales when you've got to represent that company. You've got to almost most of the time, you've got to say that their products are the best or uh, you've got all these little things pulling on your subconscious in different ways that you might not realize. He never did any of that. And that's what came to mind as you were going through all this. And you brought up another point then, which I think is worth diving into a bit deeper. Patricia, what is the difference between saying yes and versus yes, but? Oh, it's a world of difference. Yes, but really is a no. The, uh, it, we think we're being agreeable and um, observant. And the truth of the matter is the, the yes, but is an immediate denial or negation of whatever has gone before. In order to say yes and, you first have to get what that yes is. And that, by the way, that doesn't mean that you agree it means that you open and take in and understand what has just been offered. You have to hear it. And what can you, what can you then do to add on to that rather than to negate it? Um, 
so that we 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 all know how to go yes but and it's it's the mechanism we use all the time to come back to our own ideas yes and really um, makes us reach forward to actually hear what the other person has said and see what is a value and how we can work with that rather than um, combat it. I, the, I think the world has become um, full of yes butters and, uh, and it's, it's, why, it's, it's why I think our political system has bogged down. We don't know how to agree. We don't know how to find the point of agreement. We, um, great negotiators understand this. They're looking for what is possible, for what I can value in this situation where we, are, uh, we have differences. So I think a great salesman is always looking to find, the, um, find out what the customer or the other person wants and build on that rather than saying, however, but you really want something else and trying. Then we get into persuasion and I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I think you've got this absolutely nailed. So I, f I feel that Sales Nation, people listening to this, the first response in any negotiation is, Yes, but in that they want to secure the biggest piece of the pie for themselves and they want to stop the negotiations moving any further forward. And we've had negotiation experts and researchers come on the show and they unanimously they agree that it's a yes and scenario that you should be aiming for. And the reason I brought this up is, do you feel like it's harder to say yes and because then you've got to improvise, think on your feet and actually use your brain versus a yes but is an easier solution because you know where you stand then and it uses a little less glucose in your brain there's a little less processing that needs to go on you're right that the but allows you to go back on your script and so what we have is just script 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 rather than the creativity that comes when you take an idea that isn't where you are and how do we develop that? You're right, you, your brain comes alive with the and, and that's where the improviser um, is. Uh, th that's when you're improvising. And just to move on from that slightly, uh, I've got a question that I know, well, one at least one person's emailed me when I mentioned that you were coming on the show to ask about this specifically. What do we do, Patricia, when everything goes to abs absolute <laughs> rubbish in a sales meeting, when uh, everything breaks down, when they, perhaps they're not angry, That's we can say that. They're not angry with you, but things aren't going the way that you assume they were. You have to physically go off script. You have to throw it out. Is there a, this might be, uh, I don't think oxymoron is the right way to describe it. It might be paradoxical, but is there a process to be, to improvise when everything goes wrong? Or... Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful question, wonderful question. And I can just see the moment that you're talking about in that meeting. And what is desperately needed here, rather than everyone crossing their arms and walking out of the room, um, is for someone the, to say, man, this is falling apart, isn't it? Oh, what a disaster. To actually name what's going on, which is, Wow, I, we have totally fallen apart here, haven't we? We're, we're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And someone at that point, seeing that, naming what's there, could also apologize. I'm really sorry. I, it's because we're hoping that we can get together. What you need when you get to, um, it, when you're in the middle of a big mess, is for someone to be honest and name that. Golly, this is a disaster we've got on our hands. Maybe there's a way to fix it. I'm really sorry, because I'm hoping we could get together. That, that's when being human and stepping in, naming what is going on, rather than just polarizing and going in opposite directions. Because if somebody says, isn't this a mess? Everyone's gonna immediately, I think, relax. Um, or it, it could help the situation. I totally agree. I, I totally agree in that it, it diffuses that tension, which is, and it feel you can feel it you can cut it with a knife in the air it's going up and up and up and up and then that's when people just slam down pens and walk out of the room it's never happened to me um, but i know for sure people it has happened to and i think w would you call it b 
be having humility and just be able to take perhaps it on the chin, even if it isn't your fault. It's worth sacrificing that. And it, it, it allows you to build empathy as well with the people in the room if you're willing, even if they know deep down that they've been an idiot and they've been winding everyone up and they've been a problem. If you it's take responsibility. It's never a question about who's right or who's wrong. What is, what, what is needed, and you use the word humility, but I think it's common sense, frankly, that we... Um, we need to be able to publicly say, whoa, I apologize. Or at least you can apologize, not for the ideas that you've had, but I apologize that we've gotten to this, uh, we've gotten to this polarity. That there is always some way that if you lower your own status, you raise the status of everyone else in the room and make them feel better. So you can often diffuse a bad situation instead of by holding your guns to uh, allow yourself to um, let everybody know that you, you're you human, that you can make mistakes, and that you're not the perfect one. We, we want to be in the room with another human. And being human means saying, um, I made a mistake. I love to hear apologies. I love to give apologies because it means I, I'm, I do make mistakes all the time, but I'm noticing them. Um, what would I, you I say to the the if there was the stereotypical male salesperson listening who is the alpha male they are never wrong they are a you know, passionate business person their solution is the best they they feel like it's a weakness perhaps to admit mm. guilt or responsibility what would you say to them uh, and bearing in mind the fact that you've very likely worked with highly successful people and i imagine they're not like that are they well what i'd say to them is that I want you to rethink that. You think it's weakness to admit that you're wrong or to apologize. It's the, it's the greatest kind of strength, actually. It shows you are, you are big enough to see yourself in a larger context. Um, holding on to your rightness or righteousness is to me never a sign of strength. It's really a sign of kind of narrow-mindedness and stupidity in my view. <laughs> So um, think about the people in, in public life or those that you admire. They will be very quick to, um, to uh, apologize or to say, I'm sorry. Um, those are two, I'm sorry and I apologize are two things we need to say a lot more of because we're always stepping on each other's toes. And if we get used to that rather than um, having to defend our position, people are gonna like us better and we're going to feel better about ourselves. So I want to tell that alpha male, uh, can I get over it? <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, Patricia, I've got a couple of questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show. I know you are not an out and out salesperson, but clearly being the, the improv queen, if I can call you that, you'll, you'll be able to nail them. The first one, who is the world's greatest salesperson? It's greatest salesperson. Oh, greatest salesperson. Is someone that you trust? I think I'd buy things. Uh, I would take the advice of someone that is trustworthy. I know you're looking for a, a particular example of that. Um, sometimes these people are um, members of our family or a teacher that we've had. That the greatest salespeople to me are those that are listening, uh, listening to me, I guess, because we all want to have somebody listen to us, and who, who are human. And that, that humanity that we've been talking about uh, becomes the factor that allows me to want to, um, to trust them. And uh, I'm not going to trust somebody who is right all the time. We've got some politicians who simply will not admit that they uh, ever have made a mistake, and that just makes them look dumb. So um, I'm a great fan of the American president, Barack Obama, and I'd, I'd buy a used car from him any day. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got that charisma there as well. I think he sums up the this image of charisma in my mind, especially in the States. I think he's a really good example of that. And, you know, not we don't want to dive into politics, but... You know, Donald Trump has some, uh, you know, his own air of charisma in a certain way, but 
I'm not sure anyone else outside looking in really has that magic, the Bill Clinton kind of magic that, you know, he's, he's renowned for. And I think a lot of it, even though he would never admit that when he'd done things wrong, he might not be the best example, but it's certainly charismatic and he certainly, uh, you know, speaks his mind and, and carries himself that way. Next one, Patricia, if you could punch someone in the face, who would it be and why? If I would punch someone in the face. Oh, I think it would be Donald Trump right now because <laughs> I, I think he's besmirching our democracy with his, uh, with his way of being um, disrespectful of, of everything. So I think I'd give him a good punch and uh, tell him to um, get off his high horse, please. <laughs> nice. Okay. And final one, question I ask everyone that comes on the show. If you could go back in time and teach your younger self uh, something about sales, what would it be and why? I would tell my younger self, look to appreciate what is going on. So find a way to say thank you early and often in every situation that you have that relates to trying to influence other people. Because none of us would be here without the efforts of a lot of other people. There are people working in um, electrical plants and things that allow the, the electricity and the technology that's allowing me to be seen by you right now and have this conversation. We're all in the debt of a lot of people. So I want to tell my younger self, uh, don't wait till you get old to be grateful and to say thank you. How, just as a side note for that, because we talk about it on the show and it's having uh, prior to doing the show i wouldn't have thought it'd been a topic that would be so core to being a, a great professional salesperson but how important is gratitude day to day uh, to your just general happiness in life well i think it's everything you've basically said it that um and, and there are there are medical studies that prove uh those that come at the day looking at it, no matter what's going on, because many of us have problems with our health and our finances and our families and the traffic and the weather. There's a lot not to like. But if you wake up and look around and start the day and go through the day with the eye of um, what am I receiving, I want to promise you that that's the best medicine that you could ever have. It's going to change your life. Try it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Patricia, tell us a little bit. I'm holding it up here for everyone who's watching on YouTube. Um, tell us a little bit about Improv Wisdom and where we can find it as well. Great. Well, Improv Wisdom, and I've got a copy here too, um, <laughs> is uh, I think of it as my daughter. She's my child and was born in 2005. It's a little book with 13 maxims that uh, are used in the improv classroom to help people improvise, whether it's on stage for a comedy or whether it's a... Uh, uh, getting through a meeting, a sales meeting without a script, or whenever you have to improvise. And these 13 rules um, involve things that we've already talked about, saying yes, being uh, play, paying attention to reality. Um, actually, one of them that might surprise you is be average. I suggest that when we try to be our best and do our best, we often, um, we're, we're using our energy unnecessarily. So if you allow yourself just to be yourself, take the pressure off, It'll often um, help you out. So Improv Wisdom is a little book. It's available through all of the online booksellers, Amazon.com or Amazon UK, uh, as well as um, most of it's still, um, it's in a 12th printing and it's in nine languages. So if you're looking to get a, a Russian copy or a, a Japanese copy, they exist too. It's also as an audio book that I, um, I'm speaking myself. I, I produce the audio book and they're all available online to download and, and as an ebook. So I encourage you, it's not a, uh, it's an easy read and you don't have to read it straight through, it's short. So I'm trying not to waste my reader's time. I hope you'll like it. I've gotten uh, nice feedback that the book is helping folks. Amazing stuff. And you know, just to emphasize that, which I don't do for every person that comes on and, and talks about books, as I said, I've got a copy myself. I really enjoy it. It's not a copy that you sent over. It's something I bought many years ago and um, I've got a lot of value out of it. So it's well, highly recommended from me, Sales Nation. And with that, Patricia, I want to thank you for your time, your energy, your improvisations, and thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. 
It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're a wonderful host. And there we have it, Patricia. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. It took us a, a couple of attempts to, to make it happen, but I think it was well worth it. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, as always, for tuning in. I appreciate your time, your attention. I say this every episode, but I do truly mean that. And yeah, with all that said, I'll speak with you all again tomorrow.